So I guess we're ready. I'm Carl, K9LA, out in uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana, north up in the northeast corner of the state, which is by oh, having a good summer day. Supposed to cool off in a couple of days, and well, then after that, it'll probably go up again. So whatever. So this is the second uh, Rat Pack presentation I've done. The last one was in September, last September in 2021. And uh, what I'm going to do is give a very quick update on cycle 25 and then talk about space weather and propagation. And we'll see what happens here. So here's what I'm going to talk about. I said a quick update on cycle 25. And after a while, we'll get around to why are sunspots important? Then we'll talk about space weather and propagation. Talk about disturbances to propagation because uh, as we uh, head up cycle 25, uh, we're going to have more and more disturbances. And we'll talk about that. And then just a quick review of the real time because uh, we, we, we got some problems with space weather, and we'll talk about that a little bit. So here's uh, the plot from last September. The red is uh, cycle 25, the thick red line. The green curve is uh, cycle 24, which was the smallest in our lifetimes, and the fourth smallest in recorded history. Uh, the orange curve is uh, of an average cycle, like cycle 23. The blue curve is of a moderately big cycle, cycle 21, which peaked in uh, 79. Uh, of course, cycle 19 was the biggest in recorded history and was uh, uh, a bit higher than the blue curve. Now, at that time, nine months ago, uh, cycle 25 was pretty much tracking cycle 24, the small cycle 24. So, of course, that, uh, oh, shoot, I'll go, we're going to have another small cycle. So, what's the data today tell us? Well, here's, uh, we've got nine more months of data. We've got a total of 24 months of uh, smooth sunspot number data. And the only thing that's changed on that plot is the red curve of cycle 25. So, right now, it looks like it's a bit above a small cycle. That's good. How much higher is it going to go? I'll let you know in a year or two. That's, that's all I can say. Uh, hopefully it'll get up to an average cycle. That would be nice. That would uh, really make the higher bands uh, uh, have good worldwide propagation with modest antennas and modest power. But all we can do is just wait and see what happens. <clears throat> So what is a smooth sunspot number? In fact, what is a smooth value? Well, uh, what we can do is count the number of sunspots every day. That's, of course, the daily sunspot number. And for cycle 23, I've plotted the daily sunspot number in red. You can see it's very spiky. So it's kind of hard to tell what's going on with the solar cycle. You can tell that it goes up and it comes down. but uh, maybe some of the more, uh, uh, you get more detail if we do some averaging. So if we, if we take the daily sunspot numbers for each month and uh, calculate the average, and we have monthly means or monthly average sunspot number. So if we plot that, that's in the dark blue, eh, it's still kind of spiky. But it does give us an idea that, hey, maybe there were two peaks to cycle 23. So what we do is uh, further average the monthly means. And we do it by averaging essentially 12 monthly means centered about the uh, month that we're interested in. That's what the green curve is on that plot. And you can see the data is very smooth. So that's why. I don't think we know enough about solar cycles to make that prediction. 
Now, if we plotted solar 10.7 centimeter solar flux, uh, we'd see the same trend that uh, the daily values are very spiky. The monthly mean values are less spiky, but still lots of spikes. And the smooth 10.7 centimeter solar flux uh, would present a nice smooth curve, and it would sh also show the uh, double peak of cycle 23. Now, if we wanted to plot extreme ultraviolet radiation, we'll talk about that in a little bit, what it's important for. Uh, we can get the same results. The daily extreme ultraviolet would be very spiky, and the smoothed extreme ultraviolet would be a nice smooth curve, and it would also show a, a double peak in cycle 23. So one reason we use smooth values, it gives us a better picture of the solar cycle. And in fact, that's how we uh, measure and record solar cycles. Uh, solar cycles are uh, recorded as what maximum smooth sunspot number was. And that's how we define a solar cycle. Now, there's another reason why we use smoothed uh, uh, values of uh, sunspot number or solar flux. That's because our propagation predictions uh, were developed with a correlation between a smooth value, smooth solar flux, smooth sunspot number, and monthly median ionospheric parameters. In other words, uh, when we run a prediction after inputting a smooth solar in, uh, value, the results are uh, monthly medians. In other words, they're 50% probability. So we don't have daily predictions. Months time frame. Uh, what's important are those white areas in that picture. Those white areas around the sunspots are called plage, which is French for beach. You know, think of a white beach. I guess that's where the uh, name probably came from in French. Now, these white areas emit lots of extreme ultraviolet radiation. So sunspots themselves do not ionize anything, uh, just like 10.7 centimeter solar flux doesn't ionize anything. It's the extreme ultraviolet radiation that ionizes the uh, F2 region, okay? And of course, the F2 region is responsible for most of our long distance QSOs and probably all of our QSOs at night. So uh, extreme ultraviolet is very important and it's tied to sunspots. Okay, now let's get into space weather and propagation. Uh, but first, I gotta bring a caveat. That's five stated that our propagation predictions are statistical in nature over a month's time frame. We don't have daily predictions. Why is this? Well, that's because in the short term, for example, day to day. Solar radiation, of course, is uh, uh, very obvious. It causes the ionosphere to vary. Geomagnetic field activity, in other words, when the K index is that can cause the F2 region to, uh, uh, to vary. And something that we're doing a heck of a lot of research on right now uh, is uh, events in the lower atmosphere that couple up to the ionosphere. For example, a hurricane or, uh, or an earthquake. Uh, that can cause a gravity wave that propagates up to the F2 region and creates a disturbance in the F2 region. We don't fully understand this last source, this third source. There's lots of research going on, but until we understand it, we won't have daily propagation predictions. In other words, we can't plug in uh, uh, today's solar flux and expect to tell us that to tell us exactly what's going on right now. And here's a, here's a great example. Uh, Here's the very the day-to-day -day variation of the F2 region in August 2009. So there are uh, uh, 31 days in August, 
Uh, it looks like uh, for some reason there wasn't any data on uh, August 10th and August 17th. So that says there were 29 days of data. And uh, what is being reported is the maximum usable frequency, the MUF, over the Wallops Island ion assigned at 1700 UTC. In other words, the Wallops Island ion assigned is the midpoint of a 3000 kilometer path. And that's the uh, maximum usable frequency that would propagate over that path with Wallops Island at the midpoint. Now, if you look at the, the vertical bars, you can see the lowest one's 11 megahertz, about 11, and the highest one's about 22 megahertz. So the MUF varied uh, by uh, two to one during the August 2009 month. So can we correlate this to the 10.7-centimeter uh, solar flux? Good question, right? Right. Here's some space weather data from August 2009. Your solar flux and the, uh, the purple uh, uh, annotation there is August 2009. The uh, sunspot number is in red. And the A index, which is a, uh, tells us how active the Earth's magnetic field was. Uh, was at a value of maximum value of 14 one in the range from zero so 14 is a that says the uh, earth's magnetic field was kind of quiet which means it probably wasn't disturbing the ionosphere much at all but the, the big question is uh, well, you can see the data, the solar flux was uh, about 66 to 88 over those 31 days. Sunspot number was zero. There were no sunspots for the whole month of August, 2009. And like I said, the A index was uh, only uh, 14, which is pretty low. So how do you correlate a two to one change in the MUF when the solar flux is constant, there are no sunspots and the Earth's magnetic field is quiet? Well, uh, it's tough. In fact, it's <laughs> it's impossible because we're missing that third source of variation in the uh... so what good are uh, the solar flux the sunspot number and uh, I picked a uh, the K index, well, SFI is the solar flux index, the 10.7 centimeter solar flux. SN is the sunspot number, if the uh, Earth's magnetic field is. The A index is an average of the eight daily K. BZ is one of the components of the interplanetary magnetic field, more, the, more on that a little bit. And SW is a solar wind, which uh, uh, is you know, coming out of the sun and hitting the Earth's magnetic field all the time. So in light of the variation of the F2 region, the fact we don't understand fully that third source of variation, all the solar flux in the sunspot number can do is suggest if the higher HF bands, 15, 12, and 10, and six meter are available. In other words, if the MUF is high enough for those bands to propagate. K, B sub Z, and SW can tell us if the Earth's magnetic field is disturbed, which usually means the F2 region is, is disturbed. Uh, it, it may be disturbed, it may not be. So uh, I, I just can't tell you what, <laughs> you know, an exact uh, result of the solar flux and the sunspot number X and B sub Z and uh, solar wind on the uh, on the ionosphere. We can just get a general idea what's going on. So, uh, understanding that, what do we desire for the solar flux and the sunspot number? Well, here's some numbers. Uh, Twenty meters is an interesting band. Uh, even if we have zero sunspots and uh, minimal 10.7 centimeter solar flux, which is around 65. 
20 meters is still going to be open during the day. Uh, that's because there's still enough extreme ultraviolet at solar minimum to ionize the F2 region, enough for propagation on 14 megahertz. Now, if we want to go to 15 megahertz, we, we sh should expect to see the solar flux to be uh, up around 100 for many weeks. And we ex should expect the sunspot number. We want to move up to 10 meters. Well, we should expect the solar flux to be around 125 for many weeks and 100 and, and the sunspot number about 120 for, for many weeks. If we want to go to six meters, well, we're going to have to see a lot more uh, solar flux and sunspots because they do, uh, like I said, they do correlate in the long term to the extreme ultraviolet. Uh, again, these are ballpark figures, uh, but, but they're kind of set up for worldwide propagation on a daily basis, not just a, you know a once or twice a, a month or so. And the term for many weeks kind of implies a smooth value. Remember I mentioned that uh, <clears throat> our propagation predictions are a correlation between smooth solar indices and monthly median parameters of the ionosphere. Now, what about, uh, what do we desire for K, B sub Z, and so SW, solar wind? Like I said, the K index is a three-hour index. It's, uh, I think it's better than the more coarse A index, which is the average of the eight three-hour K indices. And what we usually desire is K index less than or equal to three. That says the Earth's magnetic field is not very disturbed. And that then says the F2 region of the ionosphere isn't very disturbed. <clears throat> now, if you're a BHF guy and you want aurora, well, you want a high K index. But in general, for us HF guys, we'd like K to be less than or equal to three. BZ, that's the component of the interplanetary magnetic field. In other words, the sun's magnetic field that is perpendicular to the ecliptic. Okay, what's the ecliptic? Well, that's what that little figure is trying to explain. The ecliptic is the plane in which the Earth goes around the sun. Now, the BZ component is perpendicular to that plane. Well, what about the Earth's magnetic? Well, it's also perpendicular to the uh, plane, perpendicular to the ecliptic. So it, uh, uh, the BC component is very important to tell us if the uh, interplanetary magnetic feeling field is coupling to the Earth's magnetic field. <clears throat> what we desire uh, BZ to be is positive. Slightly negative is okay. If it's large negative, well, that's not good. Uh, you know, if it's minus 50, minus 100 or greater, that's not good. And that says that the uh, sun's magnetic field, the solar wind is going to be coupling into the Earth's magnetic field, and that's going to screw up the, uh, more than likely going to screw up the F2 region. <clears throat> solar wind, well, we desire it not to be too much greater than 400 kilometers per second. Uh, if we have a good disturbance to propagation, like a coronal mass ejection or a coronal hole, that speed can get up to uh, 1,500 to 2,000 kilometers per second. Now, the K index, the B sub Z, and the SW are all correlated. So if the K index is high, that says the B sub Z is going to be large negative, and that says the solar wind speed is going to be high. So you got three parameters in ID. Places. And what I did is put the parameters that I talked about in gold boxes on the N0 NBH banner. You can see I pulled this a little bit ago. The solar flux today is 129. So that's good. It's getting up there. It's uh, certainly a lot higher than 65. But uh, we'll see in a little bit that the solar flux is going up and down. <laughs> Sunspot number is 104. That's not bad. 
but again, it's uh, we just came out of a, a minimum uh, of those two numbers, and uh, things are kind of starting to go back up again. The K index was three, so that says things are pretty good. K index was pretty low. Again, the uh, A index is from zero to 400. The K index is zero to nine, so three is hmm, pretty quiet. B sub Z was minus 0.7, so that's okay. And the solar wind was uh, 475 kilometers per second. That's not bad. That's not too much greater than 400. <clears throat> now, uh, so all that gives us an idea of what's going on. Uh, note the uh, parameter MUF US boulder at the bottom there in the gold box. That's the MUF, the maximum usable frequency, over the boulder ionosan, assuming it's the midpoint of a 3,000 kilometer path. Now, it so happens that boulder <laughs> is about the midpoint for, a 3, for the 3,000 kilometer path between W6 and the Midwest. So it's a great indication of uh, how propagation from the Midwest to the West Coast is. And you can see today at uh, 2340 UTC, uh, it was 18.68 megahertz, which said 17 meters likely was open. Remember, that's a real-time measurement, and it takes into account uh, the solar flux, the sunspot number, the A index, the K index, B sub Z, and the uh, solar wind. So kind of in a way, you don't have to pay too much attention to uh, all those parameters if you're using the N0 NBH banner, because all you have to do is look at MUF US Boulder, and it'll tell you what's going on right now. And uh, Boulder is not a, not a bad uh, uh, place to try and understand what the ionosphere is doing. Uh, for locations a little bit farther south, it's going to be a little bit higher because you're getting closer to the equatorial ionosphere. For locations uh, uh, more north of Boulder, it's going to be a little bit lower as we're approaching the, uh, the polar region. But it's still a good thing to look at and see what's going on. <clears throat> so disturbances to propagation. When the uh, K index gets up there and the B sub Z is large negative and the solar wind speed is very high, uh, and what that tells us is uh, there's a likelihood of a geomagnetic storm. Now, there are two major things that can uh, cause a geomagnetic storm, a coronal hole or a coronal mass ejection. Uh, uh, and what, did, what they do is screw up the F2 region in night. So uh, it's probably, it's a problem. Uh, one of the other uh, Three disturbances to propagation is a, a solar radiation storm. That's uh, uh, due to a big solar flare causing more absorption in the polar cap, which is the area within the aurora. Polar cap because of more absorption. Path over the pole for me. India, uh, deep Russia. The third um, uh, disturbance to propagation is a radio blackout. Uh, that's uh, when uh, a big solar flare causes an increased absorption on the daylight side of Earth. And uh, all of a sudden, signals will go away. <laughs> uh, the lower frequencies are worse, the higher frequencies are best uh, when that happens. But uh, the band can get kind of quiet pretty quick. Here's some mitigation to those three disturbances uh, for a geomagnetic storm. Uh, again, it's due to a, a coronal mass ejection hole, what lower frequencies. Uh, you might want to look for latitude pass. We'll look at that in a little bit. Might want to look for skewed pass on the low bands. And of course, if the K index gets high enough, look for some aurora at VHF. So there, there's some.
a uh, uh, radio blackout hmm, an hour or two, things will be back to normal. A solar radiation storm, again, that's uh, increased uh, absorption in the polar cap. What you can do is look the other way around. In other words, instead of going a short path, you can look. It, the the uh, polar caps could be different. Increased radiation uh, from the X-ray radiation of a big solar flare. It's on the uh, daylights. Uh, and what you should do is QSI to higher QSY to higher frequencies. That's because there's less absorption. So there's some there's some mitigation you can look at. So when does disturbances occur? Well, uh, that picture of a solar cycle kind of shows where we are. We're we're kind of uh, heading up cycle 25. Uh, of course, where we are depends on ultimately on how big cycle 25 is going to be. Uh, for uh, coronal mass ejections, they are most prevalent around solar max and they cause geomagnetic storms. Uh, big solar flares uh, cause either radiation storms or a radio blackout. They're most prevalent around solar max. Coronal holes, they're most prevalent during the decline of the solar cycle and they can cause geomagnetic storms. So uh, uh, we're kind of in the quietest time of a solar cycle right now on the ascent. But as cycle 25 gets bigger, we're going to have more disturbances to propagation. And that's just taking the bad with the good, the good being as cycle 25 rises. There's more extreme ultraviolet, and that makes the higher bands better. It's the way it goes. Like I said, the geomagnetic storm is the worst of the three because of the duration and its effect on the worldwide F2 region. <clears throat> now, I mentioned that uh, uh, we're, we're about maybe a third or a halfway up cycle 25, and there's just not enough. Uh, sunspots or extreme ultraviolet radiation to keep the bands, the higher bands open worldwide on a daily basis. Most of the time right now, we're just seeing, uh, you know, uh, north-south paths and not too much east-west. It does occur, but not too often. So what one thing you should watch out for is a spike in the solar flux in the sunspot number. <clears throat> now here's a plot from July 5th, 2021 to June 20th, 2022. It comes from uh, the URL there in blue at the top of the chart. The black line is the daily 10.7 centimeter solar flux. The red line is the daily sunspot number. The blue, num the blue lines, which I didn't annotate, are the A index, the daily A index. And you can see uh, uh, back in uh, about a year ago, uh, there weren't many spikes. That's because we were just coming out of solar minimum. But you can see as time progressed over the last year, we're seeing more and more. Solar flux and sunspot number and uh, eventually they'll, they'll be uh, even higher here in the next year. Now, what I did is uh, annotated uh, one of those spikes. That's uh, CQ Worldwide uh, DX phone contest in 2021. I annotated it in green. You can see there was a spike in the sunspot number, a spike in the solar flux. And uh, uh, there were great conditions for that CQ DX contest back then. So uh, just keep an eye. Uh, it's really good when, a, when the, the, the spikes occur during a contest weekend. That makes a lot of people happy in the higher band. Uh, you can see we uh, uh, just a couple, uh, we, we hit a
number went all the way down to zero on one of the one or two of the days. But we're we've come back up again, and uh, we're going to continue to do that. As Um, let's see here, wait a minute. Yeah, okay. So another thing to watch out for is a spike in the K index. Uh, it may result in a short-term enhancement in the F2 region. And here's, here's an example of that. Uh, this is data from two ionosons, and it's the uh, F2 region MUF plotted versus uh, August 4th, 5th, and 6th. And the one on the left is at a uh, ionosonde in uh, Peru, which is a 12 south uh, latitude and 77 west longitude. <clears throat> you can see the K index spiked up at the end of August uh, 5th. And what happened to the end? degrees north and uh, 87 west. What happened when the K index spiked up there? Well, you can see there was an enhancement in the F2 region. It was short term, but if you were in the right place at the right time, wow, you could have caught something. Now, another, another great example is the 2018 California CUSO party. On Saturday, there, I, I did not hear any W6s on 10 meters. Now, remember, uh, I said that uh, uh, Boulder was in a good position to, to uh, uh, show what the path from the Midwest to the West Coast was doing. Well, the K index spiked up on, uh, on Sunday to five, and the, the MUF over the Boulder Inasan uh, went up to over 30 megahertz. Uh, on days previously, it was only about 20 megahertz, and that's why 10 meters wasn't open on Saturday. But on Sunday, it went up to over 30 megahertz and there were lots of sixes to work. So it was a short term thing, but if you're, like I said, if you're in the right place at the right time, you can be rewarded. So that brings us to, uh, uh, if you really wanna know what's going on on the bands, the best thing to do is uh, use one of the uh, online uh, applications. For example, dxmaps.com. There's a March 14th picture from 1722 to 1729 Zulu on 15 meters. East coast, west coast, uh, work in Europe, Africa, South America, into the Pacific. So that'll tell you right now what's going on and uh, if it's worth getting on the band. You can uh, uh, select a, a North America view or a world view or whatever. You can select the band anywhere from uh, 2200 meters, 137 kilohertz all the way up to four greater than 432 megahertz. So it's pretty good. There's also uh, some other ones. Uh, of course, you've probably heard of PSK Reporter, the WhisperNet, uh, <clears throat> KC2G MUF map. We'll look at that in the next slide. The reverse beacon network. Uh, if you transmit on CW in a certain format, you can uh, go listen to software defined radios around the world and see where you were received kind of an interesting way to compare two antennas too. Transmit uh, one antenna and then uh, transmit on the next one. The IARU, Northern California DX Foundation beacons, there are 18 of them worldwide. They're on 20, 17, 15, 12, and 10 meters. And uh, each of the 18 beacons transmits for 10 seconds. So in three minutes, you can tell what world wide propagation is on a given band, on one of those five bands. Kind of neat. There's also software by VE3NEA. Uh, it's called Pharos, F-A-R-O-S. It uh, syncs your radio up to the beacon timing. So uh, you know exactly which beacon is transmitting on which band right now. And then you can take data and you know how, how strong or what was the signal to noise ratio for that beacon you're hearing and lots of out of it. There's a uh, view prop uh, by ZL2HAM. It's kind of new. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, the Space Weather Woman, WX6SWW. Uh, 
Tamitha, she can, Dr. Tamitha, she can, uh, she does her videos uh, on a regular basis and uh, gives solar uh, update, uh, so, you know, what, what the sun's doing and how, how that can affect propagation. So that's another way to you know, kind of get an idea of what's going on all the time. He downloads ionosun data. That's what the numbers and circles are. That's the NF at that ionosun, assuming it's the 3,000 kilometer hop. For example, from uh, uh, Idaho or something down to Florida, uh, you can kind of see what what the MUF will be. Of course, the MUF is the point of that path, so looks like it's uh, you know eighteen to twenty megahertz or so. You might twenty two megahertz, maybe uh, fifteen meters might be open on that day. Not high enough yet for uh, meter propagation. Whereas the north south paths, as you go further south, uh, the MUFs are higher because you get near the robust equatorial ionosphere. So that's why north south paths are more prevalent right now than east west. Yes, it's going to be bigger than cycle 24. How much bigger? I don't know. We're just going to have to wait. Solar max, more than likely around mid 2025. Of course, if the rate of ascent in increases, then solar max will be a bit earlier, probably, and of course, a bit higher. And use the space weather data or any of those real time uh, websites or applications to get an idea what propagation is doing right now. And of course, watch for uh, spikes in the sunspot number and the 10.7 centimeter solar flux. Take a look at the higher bands. Watch for spikes in the K index. Take a look at the uh, higher bands. <clears throat> now, even if cycle 25 turns out to be small, we should have a couple years of great worldwide propagation on 15, 12, 10 with modest power and modest antennas. So uh, if you're new to ham radio, get ready for the uh, uh, cycle. The, the main thing is just uh, get radioactive on HF. Uh, you'll have a lot of fun and uh, Hopefully, uh, you'll have a great time and field day this weekend. Hopefully, sporadic E is uh, going to be good and uh, give uh, the six meter stations uh, lots of activity. <clears throat> so, that's all I had, uh, 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 Dennis and Dan. Okay. Are there any questions out there? Yeah. Hey, Carl. Uh, I was reading, go uh, oh, probably last year sometime. Um, about some uh, suggestion that changes in HF propagation could predict uh, earthquakes <laughs> uh, because they they said there was some some change in the uh, ionosphere that resulted from the movement of rocks. That seemed like very outlandish to me. Sounded like an Emil Heisseluft article, but it wasn't. Uh, have you heard anything about that that is credible? Oh yeah, I've seen. Uh... Lots. Okay. Yeah, I, I've seen lots of peer-reviewed uh, articles. Uh, uh, using the ionosphere as a precursor to earthquakes. Uh, of course, the uh, the signature in the ionosphere is very small, so you have to do a lot of math to extract. But it 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 it's a possible precursor. Due to due to the earthquake, well, it, it could be to a volcano like Mount St. Helens back in 1980. It, uh, <laughs> it was bigger than an earthquake, really, and it really uh, caused the F2 region to vary uh, for a short period of time, uh, within maybe you know, thousand miles of Mount St. Helens. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot of research going on in that area. So, uh, at least right now, don't write it off. Hey, thank you. Yep. Thank you, Carl. You're welcome. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Very, very interesting. 7-3, everyone. 7-3 is everyone. 7-3, Dan.